Hello to everyone. Welcome to the webinar of Anodum in Europe about corrosion mitigation in high pressure water and steam cycles. We are glad so many of you joined this webinar today. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can use the chat box to ask them. Or our team will select the questions and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. And maybe after the webinar, some topics are still in your mind which raise questions. And in that case, please not hesitate to ask us. So let's start the webinar. Uh, just to let you know, uh, it will take about 45 minutes. And after that, we will answer some questions. Today, we are going to introduce you the amalamine technology. We will talk a bit about the market conditions and the forecast. We will talk about corrosion, specific corrosion mechanisms, when they happen, and how to mitigate those at minimum cost and achieving maximum availability of your unit. Maybe some of you are not connected to the power industry, but still it will be very interesting for you to see how you can deal with corrosion in steam boiler systems. So let's introduce to you the anodamine team. In the beginning of 2000, anodamine uh, incorporated was established by Paul Hetting. At that moment, Paul Hetting was already a pioneer in applying the film forming amine technology in steam boiler systems. But the specific disadvantages of this technology made him think of an alternative for film forming amines. The common problems were increase of cation connectivity by composition of the amines. They form small organic acids, cyclic molecules like benzene, for example, all those kind of things. And also there is a risk of formation of fatty deposits and so-called gunk balls when overdosing. Then he developed a chemical substance which could solve the negative effects and fulfill all of the requirements of the cycle chemistry. Meanwhile, anodamine is the benchmark to serve as active chemistry in the USA and is now spreading globally. Currently, we treat over 200,000 megawatts generating capacity, of which a significant part consists of mixed metallurgy systems. These systems do not only consist ferrous, but also have copper parts in the water and steam cycle. This is very challenging metallurgy in terms of corrosion mitigation if the unit is operated in the cycling or discontinuous way. We also treat many supercritical units, all with full flow condensate polishing filters, both deep bed filters and powdex filters. So let's introduce your anodamine team of today. First, Alvin Verstraete. He has many years of experience in chemical water treatment and spent over 10 years of his career as chief chemist of an 870 megawatt combined cycle plant. He was also the first one who applied anodamine in Europe. Since 2018, he joins the European team of Anodomy. I am Manfred Janssen. Since 1993, applying film forming technology at steam boilers, and also the same experience with the specific disadvantages as Paul Hetting already encountered. In 2014, I was looking for a solution for those problems, and during research, I discovered that Paul Hetting had exactly the same ideas, but unfortunately, some years before me. Nevertheless, I started representing anodamine in Europe in 2014 and uh, the first and most important task at that time was getting the REACH registration, which we did in 2017. And now we are expanding the application of anodamine in Europe, mainly driven by the results of our applications at other European power plants. So let's talk a bit about the current energy market and how it's related to the corrosion problems. From this forecast, you can see that the energy market is changing. That will be no surprise to you. In order to lower CO2 emissions, there is more and more renewable energy available, which you can see from the red part and the blue part. And in this table, you can see how rapidly the energy market is changing. In just one year, from 2017 till 2018, there is already a clear shift in fossil fuel power generation and generation by renewable energy. This slide shows clearly the influence of wind and solar on energy production. If you look only at the conventional generated power, 
you can see an erratic changing load. The important expectation up to 2050 is that power generation from coal will be reduced significantly and gas-fired power plants will remain important to secure a stable energy network. In this webinar, our focus is on cycling power plants and the problems due to load-varying operation, which interfere with the reliability and the availability of the unit. The corrosion problems, which we will discuss, are not only related to power plants, but are about any steam boiler system which suffers from corrosion. Existing coal-fired power plants and a lot of the older combined cycle power plants were not designed for cycling operation and extended offload periods. These units were designed to run base load operation. The current cycling operation results in a shift of temperature and flow. This affects the integrity of the used metals and can cause corrosion. If you would have known before about the different operation with a lot of starts and operating at maybe 40% of the design capacity or even lower, you would have designed the system differently. And a redesign and upgrade of the older units is very costly or even impossible. If the number of starts and cycling operation have increased a lot, but your unit has not designed for it, you may enter an area in which corrosion and fatigue will be a big risk for the reliability of your unit. For baseload units, the conventional chemistry based on ammonia, phosphate, and maybe oxygen scavengers for mixed metallurgy systems has proven to be sufficient to comply with all of the international standards for water and steam purity. However, with the cycling operation and many shorter and longer stops, the conventional chemistry is not capable anymore to comply with the high standards for water and steam purity. And those are imperative to ensure good and reliable operation of your unit. So there is a need for enhancing the cycle chemistry to cope with the current challenges. Anodamine is a specially designed product for application in high pressure units, which are operated under challenging conditions regarding many stops, longer offload periods, and erratic cycling operation. The anodamine molecule is an extremely thermal stable organic corrosion inhibitor and it's not a replacement of the chemistry, the conventional chemistry based on ammonia, but it is added to it. I want to emphasize that although it sounds like an amine, the name anodamine, it is not an amine. But for yourself it's very easy to remember. Just remove the A and the D from the name and you get no amine. So it's no amine. So simple. So let's talk about how anodamine works. First of all, there is a distinctive difference between the conventional chemistry and anodamine enhanced chemistry. With the conventional chemistry, you treat the water. So you control the cathode and by that indirectly, you hope to preserve the anode, which is your acid, the unit. The unit is the part you want to re be reliable and available. With the anodamine enhanced chemistry, you protect the part you want to protect in a direct way by electrical chemical isolation of the anode, which is the unit itself. The corrosion protection by anodamine comes in three stages. Stage one occurs when you start dosing it. The molecule of anodamine is pulled towards the metal surface by a force called Seebeck effect. This is a thermoelectric effect in which the electron density at the cold side differs from the density at the heated side. Anodamine is pulled through the porous semi-protective oxide, which is the top oxide, and it's pulled right down towards the protective oxide and metal surface matrix, and that's the part you want to protect. That's your unit, your asset. During this process, the anorganic impurities are forced out of the porous oxides, which can lead to a temporary increase of cation conductivity. This phenomenon is called cycle clearance. And the increase of cation conductivity is not caused by anodamine, but due to its effect. The duration of the cycle clearance depends on the thickness of the oxides in the system and the amount of impurities within these oxides. You can easily control the cycle clearance by varying the doses of anodamine in case the cation conductivity would exceed guidelines. This mechanism of anodamine 
is significantly different from film forming amines which cover the entire oxide layer and do not penetrate the oxides. This will or can result in trapping the impurities within the oxides and for example it can still provide conditions for under deposit corrosion. Stage 2 is barely more than further saturation of the porous oxides with anodamine. Meanwhile the oxide is clean as you can see, and starts to contain more and more hematite. More anodamine content means also more hydrophobic properties of the oxides, so you can evidence also the migration of the molecule. And finally, after sufficient operational hours at a sufficient anodamine residual in the cycle, you can reach stage 3. And stage 3 protection is a fully with anodamine saturated oxide, which also has a higher content of hematite and is also totally hydrophobic. Even in two-phase locations, where the oxygen is predominantly present in the steam phase, you will see the development of hematite. And later on in this website, we will show you some comparisons to visualize this property. Maybe even more important is the distribution ratio of anodamine, which is about 1 to 1. And since anodamine is attracted to metal surfaces of the entire system, it also provides a good protection of the steam path. In these parts, there is no liquid phase during operation, but still anodamine will saturate the oxides of the steam path, which is clearly distinguished by a fully hydrophobic surface of, for example, superheaters and reheaters, as you can see from this image on the right side. So to summarize, here are all of the three stages you can see in your unit when you're applying anodamine. In this table, you can see a comparison of oxide composition of boiler evaporator tubes in a conventional coal-fired unit, which is located in the USA. Although AVTO chemistry, the amount of oxygen within the oxides is still limited. And after two years of exposure to anodamine, Independent investigation shows that the oxygen content has been considerably increased, although the dissolved oxygen of the feed water was kept the same. This indicates clearly a higher ratio of hematite within the oxides, and so a more stable and passive oxide when using anodamine. Key performance indicators. So some of the remarkable properties of anodamine were already mentioned, but I will name the nine most important key performance indicators of anodamine. One, a complete compliance with OEM and international standards for water and steam purity, even at supercritical units using one ppm anodamine on the feed water, which is a normal dose rate, you will have a typical 0 0.08 microsiemens per centimeter of steam cation conductivity. Boom, this is the most important one. Two, due to the electrical isolation of the anode, there is no threat of oxygen for copper and copper alloys. So for the ones uh, which have metallurgic um, units with also copper inside, this is a very important one. This oxygen, however, is needed to create the preferred hematite of oxide uh, in this layer. The oxygen is our friend even at cyclic operation, and even at cyclic operation of mixed metallurgy systems. Anodamine will protect it. Three, anodamine is a single substance chemistry, no mixture of several components. Anodamine has no effect on the pH of the cycle. To control the cycle pH, just use ammonia. And for sure, no alkalizing amines because they will poison the cycle with degradation products like organic acids. Four, research by EPRI has shown that anodamine is preventing pitting, which is the initiator of stress corrosion cracking. Anodamine is not only mitigating this corrosion mechanism, it is even inverting the corrosion mechanism, so the prevention is a solid 100%. There is just one remark to this, there has to be sufficient anodamine residual in the cycle. Yeah, if you dose nothing, you gain nothing, of course. Five. Anodamine provides protection against single and two-phase flow accelerated corrosion. Especially flow accelerated, flow, sorry, accelerated corrosion in two-phase areas is difficult to mitigate 
because you need oxygen and alkalinity in the liquid phase. But both oxygen and ammonia will predominantly be present in the steam phase. 6. Anodamine provides protection against corrosion fatigue. Now to some of you this must sound a little bit odd because corrosion fatigue is not a driven by chemical mechanism. It is a it, it is a it's a mechanical thing, not a chemical thing. Still, the surface within these cracks will develop corrosion products which act like a kind of wedge which allows you allow the crack to mitigate further. And since anodamine is a corrosion inhibitor which is penetrating the oxides, it will suppress the development of corrosion products within these cracks and by this mitigate the corrosion fatigue. We have several practical applications at units which suffered from corrosion fatigue before and after starting anodamine dosing, these units didn't show any chemical related tube failures anymore. Anodamine has an extremely low toxicity. The LD50 toxicity, the little dose, 50% of the organisms will die, is 170,000 milligrams per liter. And this is according to the REACH registration file. So it's that non-toxic that you could drink it. In fact, the chemical and ecotoxic properties of anodamine would require no safety data sheet at all. Number eight, as already mentioned before, anodamine has an extremely high thermal stability. According to our experience and testing, at least up to 600 degrees Celsius. And we know that is not decomposing at that temperature. As a result, with adding anodamine to your existing conventional chemistry, you will maintain exactly the same cation conductivity and degas cation conductivity as before. The only increase would be a cycle clearance at the start of the application. You remember the stage in which organic, the inorganic contaminants are being forced out of the oxides. There is no risk of sticky deposits or gunk balls or compromising effects on instrumentation. And finally, nine, elimination of oxide transport. Some vendors imply that it is a great advantage that their chemistry is removing excessive oxides from the surface. Causing oxide transport is certainly something you would not want to experience in your system. Anodamine is not causing any increased oxide transport, it just stabilizes the oxides, it transforms those into a more pure and dense oxide. EDM, SEM studies show a reduction of deposit wall density and an increased oxygen content of the oxides without any increased oxide transport in the cycle. So, now we have talked a lot about the market conditions and the theory of mitigating corrosion. We are glad to show you now some several practical examples which will give you an idea about the great potential an advanced chemistry can offer your system and the benefits of it. So let's start with flow accelerated corrosion. Let's call it, by the way, FAC. It's much more simple. So simply put, FAC is a corrosion mechanism of carbon steel in which the dissolution of the oxides is faster than the development of new oxides. Eventually, the effect is metal loss and wall thinning to such an extent that piping and other surfaces can be damaged. There are some notorious cases of FAC known, with a very big impact and damage in terms of cost and sadly even fatal effects. Research and statistics indicate that FAC is the most occurring and most destructive corrosion mechanism in power cycles. A number of variables influence the mechanism of FAC, like flow change, geometry, temperature, roughness of the surface, pH, and oxygen content. Some variables you can control and others you can't. You cannot change your system, it's there. But you can change other things like pH and oxygen. That are the variables which you can control in a good way to successfully mitigate single-phase FAC. In two-phase FAC, 
where both water and steam exist, mitigating FAC is a totally different story. It is very challenging to mitigate two-phase FAC because the ammonia and the oxygen like to be in the steam phase, which leaves the liquid phase with a relatively low pH under reducing conditions. These are some typical appearances of FAC. The first picture shows you orange peel or horseshoe shaped pits, and that's typical for single phase FAC. The second one, black and shiny surfaces. So you see the, the red surface, which is hematite, and then the top right is black. It's just that the oxides have been um, solubilized. There is no oxide left anymore. So those black spots, those flat black areas, they indicate two-phase FAC. And the last one is tiger striping. This is uh, uh, partly removal of oxides. Uh, you see this, for example, in condensers. So there is a direct relation between the temperature and pH and the stability of magnetites, which is dissolving. In single phase, the increase of pH and or oxygen in most cases is sufficient enough to mitigate the FAC. Again, Two-phase FAC is much more challenging because the alkalizing agent and oxygen prefer to be in steam phase, and exactly in these conditions, anodamine is performing very well. Meanwhile, many inspections have shown regrowth of hematite in two-phase areas when anodamine is being applied. Anodamine is capable of forcing more oxygen and more alkalinity into the liquid phase. Here is an example of an LP drum of a combined cycle, which is an OT chemistry. In about 18 months, there is a clear regrowth of hematite visible. In this example, the basic conventional chemistry was not changed. We just add anodamine to it. And here is an example of another combined cycle, LP turbine exhaust duct, two phase area, and here the comparison is even more remarkable because in this situation, on the left side, a film forming amine was used. It is clearly visible that the film forming amine was not able to form a protective film under these circumstances because the molecule is predominantly present in the steam phase, like ammonia. On the right side, a total different story. Regrowth of protective oxides and no offload corrosion at all. This picture was taken three weeks after the unit was taken offline. So the stagnant water, which you can see on the bottom, is saturated with oxygen. And here, the same combined cycle, but now the IP risers, so which are also two-phase locations. And again, a very clear difference. Film forming means are not capable of providing regrowth of the oxide. During stops, the unprotected surface develops offload corrosion, which you see here. And it's obvious that during operation of the unit, metal loss is also occurring. How different appears the same exact location six months after using an anodamine treatment? There is a clear regrowth of protective oxides. The whole pipe is getting reddish, uh, pink reddish. And the location does not show any signs of offload corrosion. And also this picture was taken three weeks after taking the unit offline. So let's go on to the copper protection. Okay. If you have alloys of copper in your system and the rest is carbon steel and you have a cycling unit, you have a challenge when using conventional chemistry. It is virtually impossible to please the copper and the carbon steel at the same time. And this is because why it is. <clears throat> the passive area of copper is roughly pH 8 till 9, so your chemistry will be in, in this window. But it's not the same as the passive area for carbon steel. As you see here, that's higher, 9.5 till 10 about. So if you please the copper by removing the oxygen and keep the pH limited, you will have a problem with your carbon steel. And if you want to please your carbon steel with pH and oxygen, you will have a problem with copper. So how can you solve this dilemma? As previously discussed, 
The anodamine addition provides an electrical isolation of the anode. And by this property, it is possible to run a mixed metallurgy unit at higher oxide levels and higher pH without increasing the copper corrosion, but with improving the protection of carbon steel. This graph shows the transition from AVTR chemistry to AVTO chemistry plus anodamine. A very remarkable observation is the reduction of copper transport even at the elevated pH. And you can see the line from left to right that uh, with anodamine we increase the pH up to about 9.5, 9.6, and the copper transport is virtually zero. In this example, you see the oxide transport during cold stars, AVTR versus AVTO plus anodamine in a mixed metallurgy system. The difference in oxide transport left and right is obvious. This is the same unit, uh, but in cycling operation, the difference in oxide transport left and right is again obvious. And please note that we consider different scales on the y-axis because of the oxide levels of the AVTR chemistry. So here we have another scale, as you see, this is a base load uh, operation of the same unit. So still during base load, there is a clear advantage in favor of the AVTO plus anodamine treatment. And imagine how much you could save on terminating chemical cleanings if you mitigate oxide transport this much. The transition from AVTR to AVTO plus anodamine chemistry is not just stopping the first one and start the second one, that, that won't work. First, we need to chemically isolate the entire anode before we can raise the pH. And by anode, I mean the copper. So first, we add anodamine to the existing AVTR chemistry and let it build up inside the oxides. No change to the chemistry except adding anodamine to it. Reduction of copper transport is a sign of improved corrosion protection. And from there, we can stop the reducing conditions and start to increase the pH step by step. So I will show you now an animation, hope it works. So this is a unit in Poland, um, was operating always base load, and the Polish government said uh, from one to the other day, okay, uh, very nice, we will uh, run this unit now in a cycling mode. And no change, maybe minor change to the system. And this is an old coal-fired unit with over 300,000 operational hours. And the engineers were concerned because of this decision, and they knew they had to come up with solutions to ensure the reliability of this unit. So what we do, what we did was first did a, did a baseline. So we did measurements, uh, the, the unit was running, cycling, as you can see, week by week, low loads, higher loads, varying loads. And then we started to use an odomine. Existing chemistry, AVTR, plus anodamine. And we let it run. We let it run. Just running the system. And then at a moment in time, there will be a residual of anodamine present in the cycle, which means that the oxide is starting to saturate it with anodamine and a certain residual is building up in the cycle. And this keeps on for a few weeks and the residual is building up more and more and then at some point we decide okay oxygen uh, level increase copper levels decrease we are sure that we can reduce a little bit of the oxygen scavenger just a little bit to be sure nothing strange happens run like this okay week 15 because of the high residuals of anodamine we decided to reduce the dose rate of anodamine Worked also very well, no increase of the copper content. And then in week 16, we were convinced we could reduce the oxygen scavenger to zero. Lack of oxygen scavenger was also a reduction of pH, so we are forced to dose a little bit of ammonia to correct the pH to the normal levels, and we run from there. And we did, week 17, and week 18, and then finally, as the last part of the conversion, we reduced the phosphate totally down to zero, and we added some more ammonia to increase the cycle pH to a higher level. And from there, we run AVTO, 
ammonia plus anodamine. So this is a time frame of about 15 weeks and it worked very well, which you can see on the next slide. So this is another view of the transition. You can see the red curve. The red curve is AVTR chemistry plus anodamine. And you can see the, the, the big drop of copper transport during this starting of the dosing. In the yellow part, we reduced the oxygen scavenger to 50%. Uh, the pH was going down, loss of alkalinity due to loss of oxygen scavenger. And in the blue part, there was totally no oxygen scavenger dosing anymore, and even a lower pH. And we corrected this pH uh, by dosing more ammonia to the normal levels in the green part. And then you see ammonia plus anodamine and totally low copper levels. And again, the same call unit, but now the analysis data of the oxides by the customer himself. And in this comparison, the compliance to the VGB guidelines is shown. On the left side, AFTR conditions. On the right side, AFTO plus anodamine conditions. Obviously, red means non-compliance and green means compliance. So at the right side, you have a lot of green data, which is compliant with the VGB standards. So let's move on to the offload protection. The preservation of a power cycle during shutdown is very important for any power plant. Still, this is often one of the most neglected aspects of operations. Ignored or poor layup will result in offload corrosion. Offload corrosion can be the initiator of serious failure mechanisms. Failure mechanisms will interfere with the plant's availability. It's that simple. The choice of cycle chemistry is strongly depending on the metallurgy and how the unit is operated. Extended offload periods leaving oxygenated stagnant water in any circuit is bad practice and will cause pitting and increased loads of oxide transport during starts. In most of the plants, operators increase the pH with extra ammonia before offload periods. The success of this layup method depends very much on whether the unit is put into surface as planned within hours, some days, or the grid demands leave the unit longer and unplanned out of service. So how can you deal with those challenges? What can your life make more easy? So let's have a look at the next slide then. With a conventional chemistry enhanced with anodamine, you can be sure that during operation you will comply with the OEM and international requirements for water and steam purity. So that we know already. But what happens during offload periods? Is the unit protected against corrosion? For how long? Is the unit completely protected? Also the steam path? All these important questions have to be addressed. The distribution ratio of anodamine is about 1 to 1. There will be an equal anodamine residual in the steam phase and in the water phase. If the unit has been operated with a sufficient anodamine residual, you will obtain a superior corrosion protection of metal surfaces within the entire cycle. So let's see some practical results we have obtained. As example, this is a 2 plus 1 combined cycle, 800 megawatts, which was using anodamine for about 1,250 hours prior to the inspection. In this example, we see the bottom of the LP steam turbine exhaust towards the air-cooled condenser. Due to the previous FAC in these two phase locations, there is lack of protective oxides, which you can clearly see from this picture. Still, this bare metal surface is strongly hydrophobic, which shows you the presence of anodamine, and the stagnant water was standing for three weeks. This water was standing for three weeks, meanwhile fully saturated with oxygen, and the water is still crystal clear and does not show any signs of corrosion. So bare metal, corrosion protection, no offload corrosion. The same unit, and also about the same location, but a bit more towards the air-cooled condenser, and here you can see the comparison of performance between film-forming amines and anodamine. Even at a longer exposure time and at a higher dosage, the film forming means were not capable of protecting the metal against offload corrosion. It is in my experience and to my opinion 
that film forming amines need oxide to create an amine film. No oxides, no amine film. It does not sufficient protect bare metal against corrosion. And now the mean on the other end is a totally other technology and has for sure the affinity to metal surface and not just to the oxide. It will also protect metal, bare metal. And so in the exact same location, if you can see, look closely, you can see that it's really the exact same location. Anodamine has the property to prevent corrosion very well. And also, again, the pooling water there, three weeks standing, fully saturated with oxygen, no offload corrosion at all. So a totally different view from the used film forming means before. So a bit further down this, uh, the stream, um, there is an air cooled condenser, as uh, some of you might recognize. And this is really a textbook example of offload corrosion protection. Everywhere, well protected surfaces and even at two phase location, which have minor or no protective oxides. You can see some parts which really don't contain a lot of oxides or no oxides, and there is totally no offload corrosion. If you zoom in to the right side, you can see about 10 centimeters of stagnant water, and this water is still crystal clear. You can barely see that it's water, so clear it is. And this is again three weeks after the unit was taken offline. So no offload corrosion at all. So besides inspections, there are also other useful ways to determine the performance of the offload corrosion protection. And that is, for example, by using an online turbidity measurement. And you can do that in condensate, treat water, um, LP, IP drum, wherever you want to do that. And this measurement registers the amount of particles which represent the oxides or the particulate iron. So if your unit has an offline corrosion, these corrosion products are transported during the start of your unit. Lower this oxide transport and you know the offload protection against corrosion has improved. And you can see this from your turbidity measurement. In this particular case, the graph, it shows you an example of a 435 megawatt once true combined cycle operated at shifting, um, yeah, at two shifting. After a typical weekend stop, there was a certain amount of corrosion product transported during the start. As you can see, it's the red part. And after 1,500 hours application of phenodamine, you can see that the transport of corrosion products has been decreased noticeably. Here you can see the same combined cycle, but now with comparable cold starts. You can see a significant decrease of corrosion product transport and so an increase of corrosion protection of your asset. Remember, nothing was changed but adding the anodamine to the existing conventional chemistry. And this is the result. Related to the previous page with turbidity during cold starts, this customer also conducted measurements of total iron. And every time the samples were taken exactly one and a half hours after the start of the gas turbine in order to have a one-to-one -one comparison, or one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one in this case. The result of the iron measurement shows a good correlation with the turbidity results. So the turbidity measurement is really a good tool to control your offload corrosion and the improvements of your offload corrosion protection. So, one more turbidity testing, and this time from another 2 plus 1 combined cycle, and also here a comparable significant reduction of turbidity during hot starts after just two months of application of anodamine. And the same cycle, but now with warm starts, the reduction of oxide transport during these starts is really remarkable. Uh, if you look closely to the graph, the red line is the turbidity of the unit and the left part without anodamine on the right side with anodamine and you can see a clear difference. So once again nothing was changed to this psychochemistry we just added anodamine to the existing conventional chemistry and all of the oxide which is not flowing anymore through your unit means preservation of your asset. Stop after stop, start after start. 
So, we saw a lot of information now. We saw a lot of pictures with results. We saw the modern, forced way of operating power plants and the need of corrosion protection. So what are the benefits of using our technology for this purpose? I would like to mention 10 of the benefits, because there are many more. Benefit one, asset lifetime optimization. The more you can prevent metal turning into oxides, the longer your unit lasts. It's that simple. Shorter starting curves. With a noticeable improved corrosion protection and reduced oxide transport during starts, you reach steam quality requirements sooner and you minimize bypass operation, which will save you time and money. Shorter bypass operations make your unit more interesting to the market, availability, and the corrosion, which is now minimized, makes your unit more fail safe, reliability. Elimination of chemical cleanings. Not so important for younger units maybe, but important for older units. Anodamine will reduce the oxide transport and by a big part. Oxides, which are not transported, also can cause buildup of oxides elsewhere. The reason for chemical cleanings is not existing anymore. Even units with a questionable oxide density can benefit from the anodamine technology since oxides will become cleaner and more compressed, as said before, without any oxide transport. Benefit 5. Protection of valves. Leaking valves cost money. It's logic. Not only overhauling them costs money, but the leakage costs also money. And don't underestimate the costs involved for these losses. They are really big. Benefit 6. Offline corrosion protection. Now, we already showed some clear convincing results about improved offline corrosion protection. Is it not promising that with a simple enhancement of your chemistry you can skip additional offline corrosion protection, nitrogen capping, dehumidified air? You can keep your unit longer on wet layup without any additional means. And this is also a big money saver. Number seven. Filter lifetime, maybe not that considerable saving, but still the increased filter lifetime. These mechanical filters are often used for condensate polishing systems. The less corrosion product transport, because of the anonymous application, the longer the lifetime of these mechanical filters, so less cost. Blow down reduction. Do you still need to use alkalizing agents? Not anymore. You can terminate the solid alkalizing agents without any compromising side effects. And the reduction in blowdown and cost savings involved are really, really huge. We have tens and tens of units successfully switched from phosphate or caustic treatment to all volatile, ammonia, and anodamine. We can show you all of the evidence, all of the results. There is really no compromising side effect there. And nine, Turbine and condenser efficiency. Well, this is an interesting one. Recent EPRI research shows improved turbine efficiency and condenser performance while, while using anodamine. And this is caused by the pressure drop due to hydrophobic oxide surfaces, which provide a better heat transfer. So you have no water film anymore in your condenser, but you have droplets. So far, it is difficult to put a price tag on it, but we know it's there. If you have more inform need more information, we can try uh, to persuade EPRI to share some with us, and we can inform you about that. So, this table does not need any further explanation. I think it's quite clear. The environmental advantages of a green and sustainable chemistry is becoming more and more an important decision maker. As technology provider, we are aware of the environmental impact and counteract the pollution footprint on the natural resources. Nothing is more important to us than providing a sustainable environmental friendly solution to a challenge. Anodamine has no hazards for people who handle it, 
There are no additional requirements for storage of hazardous chemicals needed. Approval of changes to the discharge permits are easy because you are introducing a given chemistry. So, leaves us with a conclusion. In the beginning of the webinar, we showed you challenges of the modern way of producing energy. Units were previously not designed for the way of operation as the market expects today. The effect is compromising the structural integrity of the units, the availability and the reliability. In this webinar, we hoped to have shown you that there is an interesting chemical way to improve the structural integrity of your unit and to keep your unit out of the high risk zone. Keep the operational costs and repair costs as low as possible, even at challenging ways of operating your unit. So, the power industry is changing fast, and accordingly, the demands of the users. Based on all the researches and investigations in so many power plants, we are confident that we can support you to make the next step and improve the existing psychochemistry by using their anonymous technology. So, people, we have come to the end of our webinar. I hope it was really interesting to you. And I also hope that now you have a good view on the possibilities to enhance your chemistry in order to improve your operation in a good chemical, economical and environmental way. Now we will answer some of your questions. Just send your questions in the chat box or maybe you can send also the questions to our mentioned email accounts. If you want us to share this presentation with you, please let us know by email or just write it in the chat box. Thank you again for your presence and see you next time. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you, Manfred, for the presentation. Uh, we a few questions came in and uh, in the, via the chat. And um, well, let's discuss the first one, uh, Manfred. First one is about uh, we have a triple pressure HRG which contains an HP steam pressure of 170 bar and a temperature of 586 degrees. Can we use an odamine? Well, I already mentioned that yeah. we uh, run uh, a lot of subcritical units and they have uh, higher steam temperatures, higher pressures, even condens condensate polishing filters. So it's definitely yes for this one. Yeah, I think I, I fully agree. Next question, why is the pH not relevant in the anodamine protection? That was shared in the beginning of the presentation. Okay, so related to mixed metallurgy units, probably. No, in general, the protection mechanism. Um, well. I can answer that this one. Uh, the pH is not relevant because uh, anodamine is, uh, is, is aiming at treating the, the metal surface, the base metal surface, and not the water. Conventionally, pH is uh, uh, aimed to to uh, increase uh, because with the, uh, the the corrosion is is suppressed by treating the water, but anodamine is, is treating the base metal, which is um, well providing the corrosion protection. Um, yeah, the next question mean, is it doesn't mean, sorry, it doesn't mean that you can run your boiler with pH one though. Yeah, that's yeah? true. So within, sure. within limits, yes. within limits, you are much more flexible in the pH. So if you have a contamination, like uh, you have seawater cooling and, and you have a leakage, and your uh, your your pH in the drum drops uh, dramatically, and you will have um, a certain time uh, of protection against this low pH because the water, the pH, the chlorides, they don't they don't touch the metal surface. So th this is this is yeah. the the reason that the pH is not relevant, I would say, sorry, I would say less relevant. You have a more flexible chemistry when you're using this. Yeah. All right, so the next question is anodamine can be applied on stainless steel piping systems? Well, if you treat turbine steels, I would say this is a yes. 
Now, anodamine has, has affinity to metal. Yeah. So, uh, answer this question, Alwyn. Okay, no, that's uh, that's fine. Uh, anodamine is um, is treating the metal, and it's it's irrelevant which metal. So, the, the varying from aluminum to uh, copper metals to steel, stainless steel, it's uh, it's all good. Yeah. Um, the the next question. The question. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Owen, it is mentioned nuclear power plants. You yeah, see? the one before that um, is quite relevant, I think. Uh, the question asked is, uh, does the chemistry used up to now uh, influence the efficiency of uh, anodamine protection? Let's Have see. Can you answer that, Mom? No, you can do that. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, as we have shown um, in the um, presentation on the, the Polish plant, which has been using phosphate and oxy, uh, oxygen scavenger, uh, we successfully transferred it to, um, uh, to anodamine and ammonia treatment. So uh, the answer is basically a no. The, the, the transfer from one chemistry to another may be different from uh, from the one conventional treatment to another one. Um, and there is no specific need to uh, to prepare the system before anodamine can be started. Uh, so there, there's a specific change in um, um, well, in the switchover. So stopping the, uh, the oxygen scavenger before uh, um, cha cha stopping the ammonia, etc. So specific um, specific applications need to be uh, uh, viewed, uh, looked at separately. But in general, it it has no influence on the effectiveness. Yeah, it's just uh, the the way you do it. You know, you, you need to follow yeah. specific uh, steps. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Right. You pick the next one. Next question, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Can anodamine be used in nuclear reactors? How does it react with radiation? Yeah, that's a good one uh, because um, we 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 don't have any applications in nuclear industry. <clears throat> and the, the reason for it is very simple. Uh, we know that we can uh, do a lot of good things um, by corrosion uh, mitigation in these kind of systems. But if you do, uh, the formula, the formulation of your substance should be known to authorities. And um, unfortunately, no mean formulation is a secret. And we are not willing to share this. And we had one excep exception, and that was REACH, because otherwise we couldn't have a REACH registration. Um, so if the authorities uh, will grant the application of anodamine in nuclear plants, um, that's fine by me. But probably they won't accept it, because they don't know what it is. And then they don't want to uh, approve the, uh, the application of it. And that's, uh, that's the answer to this question. Oh, actually, the... Next one is, is pretty much the same. Secondary side of nuclear plants. So this has been answered already. Uh, mm -hmm. Next is also interesting. Any study made using anodamine in oil or gas pipelines or uh, refinery applications? Moffat? Um, yeah, I lost track now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, this one from uh, from Canon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's um, that's a topic uh, I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, I just can say, wait a little bit, and you will see. Because um, we have confidentiality about this topic at the moment. There is something coming. There's a test going on. That's what, what yeah. we can say. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I 
because of confidentiality, um, there are some things going on. Uh, I cannot tell you uh, about anything about this, but um, there is something interesting coming. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What else? Uh, which other questions do we have, Alvin? Um, there's one you made a suggestion for all ferrous materials only in the feed water. What is the equivalent mechanism for copper alloys with both copperous and copperic oxides? Um, hi, Barry. <laughs> Suggestion for all forest materials uh, only in feed water. What is the equivalent mechanism for copper alloys with both copper and copper? Gun? Well, that's very simple. Um, as I um, showed uh, very extensively, um, these, probably these systems uh, with copper inside are run on reducing conditions, so with oxygen scavengers to uh, avoid um, the existence of oxygen, which could uh, react with the copper alloys to make. Uh, uh, copper uh, salts out of it. So what we do is, um, in this case, and we have many of these kind of systems. Uh, about 30, 35,000 megawatts of generated power of these systems running with anodamine. And uh, so that's really, really common knowledge for us. So what we do is um, add, as I said, anodamine to the AVTR chemistry. Uh, let anodamine be absorbed by the oxides, uh, all of the oxides everywhere in the cycle. And when we see residual of anodamine and reduction of all of the oxides, copper and ferrous, we will start to decrease the oxygen scavenger. We will decrease it, decrease it, decrease it until there is no oxygen scavenger anymore. And we run oxidizing conditions. And from there, we can even further optimize the pH to protect the ferrous um, in the best way to have um, a high content of hematite in those oxides, but without interfering the copper parts. And we, we, we run uh, mixed with low systems uh, at um, the one in Poland, for example, they have sometimes 300 ppb of DO in the feed water with copper. And uh, the customer measures the copper content during starts with his AES equipment less than 0 0.5 ppb. So there is no connection between water and copper. There is a, an isolation in between and it prevents copper to corrode. I think that's the uh, answer to this question. Mm -hmm. um, the next one, what about increased condensation inside a turbine? Does this affect the protection? Um, uh, well, that's that's that that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, I can answer that one. Um, so yeah. first of all, uh, this gentleman understood very well that we have a protection uh, in the steam turbine. That's that's a good one. So I did my job very good. Um, so what we have here is um, when we have an anodamine application in a in a unit, um, you have an equally distribution of your anodamine in the steam phase and in the water phase. And everywhere it will be absorbed by a metal surface. Um, if it's copper, if it's ferrous, if it's uh, uh, stainless steel, you will have uh, an anodamine residual layer on, on top of this metal. What happens if you condensate steam, um, this, 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 this droplets of, of steam will be present on the surface of the turbine and it will make the anodamine layer dissolve again in this condensate. So you would lose your protection at that spot. And that's why it's so enormous important that the residual of anodamine is in the, in, the, in, the, in the right window to protect your unit. So if you have anodamine residual in your steam and it condenses, it creates um, a level of anodamine in this moisture and so you have a, a balance, um, how do you call it, an equilibrium between the anodamine in this droplet and anodamine on the surface. So the surface stays protected. Sometimes 
for some reason, if there is a too low uh, residual um, right before the stop, you can run into problems. So that's why it is so massively important to have the, you know, the mean technology at the right residual. It, but it, it maybe it sounds a little bit difficult, but it's not, not different from having phosphate on the right level or having the pH or ammonia on the right level, you know? So just maintain the right anodamine dosing, and if you stop your unit and you have a condensation of steam, and you have also the condensation of impurities, you have a balanced surface protected by anodamine also in the steam turbine. Good. Okay. All right. Next question um, is uh, about the use of anodamine. Where is it injected? Um, well, in in the in a power uh, system, a water steam cycle of a power plant, uh, the most common used injection point is in the condensate or in the feed water. Uh, the total flow of feed water, which means that it will be distributed throughout the whole system. So it's quite easy. One dosing pump needed for treatment of the whole uh, system. Um, and the next question is on the closed loop. Um, actually, we have very good uh, experience on some of some closed loops, uh, uh, small ones, but uh, the dose rates are a bit different compared to uh, a power plant, but mm -hmm. also has to do with the temperature, of course. But a, a closed loop system no, from 25 to 70 can be treated very well, no problem at all. Um. Just for, for, for extra information, we also have applications of district heating in the Netherlands. Um, yep. uh, bigger systems for bigger towns and uh, the, the, the results, the oxide transport in these systems is really, really low. And uh, because of the temperature and in, in these systems, because um, anodamine doesn't do anything with the pH, you should just also have also something for pH. You can choose, you can, you can use ammonia, you can choose phosphates or caustic soda maybe if you like to have an increase of pH. Um, you could also use alkalizing amines if you want because there is a low temperature, relatively low temperature, so there's no, not a great part of disintegration of the product. So you are kind of flexible, but the anodamine corrosion protection in these systems is very superior. Very low uh, amounts of oxide there. Yeah. yeah. All right, so, the next question is the test methods for ODA. I guess it, uh, it's meant for anodamine, <laughs> and uh, ODA is another yeah. uh, film-forming amine, or an, is an amine, and our product is different. But do we have a test method for residual testing in the water, uh, which has been developed by uh, Metro Toledo and uh, anodamine incorporated in the US. Uh, so they have developed a very reliable method, working without any reagents and specific uh, spectrophotometer from uh, Metro Toledo, uh, giving you the direct results in residuals of our uh, product. Yeah. And volatility is, well, Manfred already mentioned it a couple of times, it's 50-50 uh, uh, under, under high pressure conditions and uh, the lower pressure and temperature, the more product will stay in the water. Um, let's see. Yeah, we should be careful about time, um, Alwin, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. because we have about uh, yeah, yeah, well, now a few seconds left, and then uh, our broadcast will be terminated. So I think it's it's a good a good moment to. Uh, to end this webinar, um, the, the, the rest of the questions we will be uh, answered to the people uh, by their email address, so that will be okay. Um, if you have any more questions, uh, you will find our email addresses in the presentation, and please feel free to contact us. Uh, I want to thank you yeah. all very much. Thank you.